Good morning. My name is Trudy Cox and I welcome you to Inside the Newport Mansions. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Lady Carnarvon, who is joining us from Berkshire, England, specifically from High Clear Castle, uh, a building that is known to millions of people around the world as the place where Downton Abbey is filmed. Um, she is married to the eighth Earl of Carnarvon. And I guess the most important question that I have to ask right now is how are you, because I know that your husband is the godson of Queen Elizabeth. How are you celebrating the Jubilee? Well, we've it's been the most spectacular weekend, I think, to watch and enjoy over, over the last four days, Trudy. It's a lot of pageantry procession and taking time out with family to be together. And was there anything more needed than that after the last two years? through which the whole world has gone. And what an amazing world leader she is. I think what's so unique about Queen Elizabeth, is there anybody in the world, whether you agree with the monarchy or not, uh, is there anybody in the world who doesn't admire that woman? She is truly spectacular, isn't she? Lovely. She is spectacular. I mean, she's very much on the ball and, um, and has such a wealth of empathy and understanding and experience and that is of such value to political leaders as they pass through her presence if you like and I don't think many of us throughout the world are particularly happy with political leaders but I think we are all happy with an extraordinary lady who serves to lead and I think that's such an important expression. Yes she brings calmness for all of us she sends the message that we all need to settle down, just be calm, <laughs> be calm and carry on. Um, yes, I think that's what we do all try and do. I would agree with that. <laughs> that Lady still Gunnar small Mont voice. Right. Uh, and she has visited Highclere Castle, hasn't she? She has. She's my husband's godmother and she was one of my father-in-law's greatest friends and he has. And it was a it was a very special friendship and he was born in 1924 and her majesty the queen in 1926 and they knew each other when she was princess elizabeth and at the end of the second world war he was one of the young um soldiers who left buckingham palace on a ve day and danced through the streets all night with princess elizabeth and princess margaret cheering her parents from the other side of the black railings before going back inside and they shared a great love of horse racing and I think above all of the countryside she's a great countrywoman. She's very much of an outdoors woman isn't she? She loves fresh air and hiking and walking and the countryside Absolutely. as you say. And everything is done outside, whatever the weather, there's a barbecue outside and everything else. So um, I'm not put off by the British weather or the Scottish weather <laughs> or the midges. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> um, Lady Carnarvon is coming to Newport in a few weeks. She is going to be the guest of the Preservation Society on June 23rd. And there is a phenomenal event being held at Rosecliff, 6.30 in the evening where Lady Carnarvon is going to speak about a lot of things. She has written five books. She is an accomplished preservationist and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but we hope that if you are interested in learning more about preservation or maybe she'll dish a little bit about Downton Abbey and I'm <laughs> sure she will. Um, and then the many other things that she's knowledge or she's making gin on her property. I mean, we're going to have the opportunity to taste Highclere Castle gin made at Highclere Castle. So there's going to be a lot of fun that night. Music, her speech, uh, hors d'oeuvres and heavy hors d'oeuvres and drinks. And I hope that people will go to www.newportmansions.org and consider joining with us that night. So let me um, first start out at, by asking you, Lady Carnarvon, you're, you've um, done a lot of writing. So you can be considered, I think, not just a writer, but a historian. You've done a lot of family research 
Um, I think what's so unique about Highclere Castle is that history goes back 1200 years and there are still archives and papers around. So can you tell us a little bit about how you have delved into the family history and how you have then talked about it? Thank you, Trudy. I think um, for all of us looking back and understanding what our history is, we don't always agree with what happened in the past, but we need to look back, understand it, write about it, research it, and discuss it in order to understand where we are. So I, and it's so fortunate in this country, England, we are particularly lucky to have archives which have often remained undisturbed in the stately homes of England. So my earliest written record is 749 AD, when King Cuthred of Wessex was on the throne. And he granted Highclere and the estate to the bishops of Winchester, and they held it for 800 years. Mm. So it was a farm estate, it was an orchard, it was gardens, it was, you know, you were growing what you needed to eat. And there's so many lessons, fun lessons from that time. And I was writing a book, Seasons at Highclere, which was about treading lightly on this earth. And in a sense, it is looking, I hope, to share going from Downton Abbey to the Gilded Age, which is what I'm looking at behind you on the wonderful screen behind you, Trudy. It's a, a very important part of American history as well and what the architecture created, you know, to look at that particular moment in time and, of course, reflected with the wonderful TV series by Julian Fellows of Downton Abbey. So there's a really lovely um, joint approach that I hope I can make to it. And it's preservation and conservation, but being relevant to all of us today, isn't it? It's how to make people happy and interested when they walk in your doors or my doors. That's the goal. <laughs> that is the challenge. And we, we struggle with that challenge every day of the week, don't we? So Downton Abbey is, um, we'll talk about that in a second. I, again, I, I really want to concentrate on some of your writing, though. Um, th there's some really interesting people in the history of Highclere, um, and maybe you'll re reflect a little bit on Lady Almina. Um, I've read a little bit yeah. about her. You know much more. Uh, such an interesting story. Well, when Downton Abbey entered the First World War for that part of the series, the second series, I had known that Julian Fellow turned it into a convalescent home, and I decided to take the opportunity to write a book about my predecessor, Almina. So I am the eighth countess and she was the fifth countess because I knew that in the First World War, she had turned Highclere into a hospital. So she'd welcomed someone's father, brother, husband, strangers into her home and she nursed them. There was an operating theater and she tried to heal them and make them better and return them to their families. So it's such an important story for me to write about, and I loved it. And it was around, you know, four or 500 letters from all of her patients saying mm. thank you. So it's again, the things today, it's, nothing's changed. And the letters were so moving. Obviously America joined the war in 1917, whereas Canada was part of it in 1915. And there are some letters which I know of by heart because they always move me to tears. And there's one from a Canadian mother saying, Dear Lady Carnarvon, I'm thousands of miles from my son at a time I'd most likely be by his side. But your letters and telegrams of reassurance give me the hope that I may yet see him again. And I and other mothers in Canada will remain in debt to you for the rest of our lives. So these are the letters, and that's the letters around which I wrote this book and published it over here, and then random um, published it in America, which was lovely. And I remember my PA, Candice, coming into me and saying, Lady Carnarvon, um, um, Lady Armina, the real Downton Abbey, is in the New York Times bestsellers list. And I said, oh, Candice, is that good? And she said, yes, you twist, it's very good. Anyway, so she stayed in that for 60 weeks and I became quite interested in it just, just because I felt very proud that a story about an amazing lady who had so many different facets to her life, she threw the best parties, she celebrated, she ate lobster, she drank the best champagne, she, she, um, she really did a lot for other people and there she was. So she was the other half 
of the Earl who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, which is the next book I'm writing. But it's um, it was a great place to start. And then after that, I wrote a book about her successor, Catherine, mm -hmm. um, and who is American. And she her story through to the end of 1945, which, again, I have absolutely loved. So um, it's been a it's been an amazing journey and I have really enjoyed it. And I always remember being told there's a book inside all of us, isn't there? But do you know what? They're jolly hard, to, they're hard work to write. And then I write a blog as well and do the Instagram for here. So it's um, it's an ancient house which used to you know, welcome those people with quill pens who's trying to, trying to be part of the more modern world. But thank you. Armina was a, a great book. And I'm trying to write chapters which aren't too long. So you can read a chapter before you fall asleep in bed at night. And Very not smart. too heavy. And the books aren't too, when I see a huge thick book, I think, oh my goodness, I'll never make it through. So I I just base it on what I think people might enjoy again making people happy asking them to turn a page reading is such a gift and I'm afraid I like I'm surrounded by books here I can't tell you it's a complete mess and, well I um, think I read that your mother was very much of a she pounded reading into uh Lady Carnarvon is one of five girls six six you were six six, six you were the, you were the oldest child yes <laughs> and uh, I read somewhere that your mother was very insistent that you all read and that you oh, didn't yes. have a choice about it. No, no, we all read and my father was hugely well read and fluent in French and German. My mother spoke some French and, you know, we'd all studied Latin at the age of five. So we had an old fashioned upbringing, if you like. But, uh, you know, reading and um, uh, books, I think, are just amazing. And I know, you know, you can read ebooks and things like that, but... I sort of turn pages, scribble in the margins, and I quite like the feel of them. I don't know whether it's mad or not. <laughs> we, but... we like getting your um, uh, Monday blog. It arrives here, our time, around eight in the morning, and I read it religiously every week. So anyone who's interested <laughs> in learning more about High Clear and Lady Carnarvon can sign up for that and get it delivered regularly to your email box right you know it's such a good discipline Trudy I think it's helped me continue to write because every Monday I, I I write a little you know blog and mini diary essay whatever it is and um beginning middle and end as my school would have taught me and and it does definitely make sure you're practicing your writing skills and I also know the press pick it up as well, which always makes me nervous. So I always have the Daily Mail sitting on my shoulder thinking, I hope this is OK. But it's, right, um, yeah. it's good. Writing is fascinating as you try to put people in your footsteps to walk around the grounds or the rooms and draw them in. And we're such curious. Um, we're such a curious race, aren't we? We're so right. interested and and it's a wonderful attribute to be curious. I think um, we should talk a little bit about High Clear itself because I don't want anyone to think that this is just a woman who owns a house in England. This is a building of 300 rooms. And I have, I deliberately put the breakers behind me because we think of this house as being huge. And believe me, there are many nights when I wake at three saying, how are we going to pay for something at one of our houses and this is only 70 rooms so i can't imagine uh two and a half plus times your your challenges tell us about high clear all 300 rooms what was your impression you the first time you saw it it must be overwhelming uh but the thing is trudy when i first arrived for lunch at High Clear. Little did I think I'd end up marrying Geordie. So I didn't really connect the two. I'd been lucky enough to be asked to other large homes, but you don't think you'd end up there. So it's <laughs> slightly different. And, and by the time you've realized and that you are now responsible for it, it's kind of too late, <laughs> if you like. So, and also my father-in-law was a lovely man. It was an honor to meet him for what for the time I had with him. And he died pretty young and I didn't see so you. It's unexpected. And, you know, we'd had supper with him on the Saturday and he was feeling a little bit cold and not, but not great, but not bad. And then it was, it was actually the Monday, the 9-11 day, but over here that wow. sadly 
my power-in-law died. So it was an extraordinary day throughout the world and many personal tragedies and we had a slightly different personal tragedy. So it's from that then that you end up being responsible and trying to find your way forward. But it's a beautiful house and I'm really honored that you're asking me to come over. So I hope as many people as possible will come and support you for in book tickets at newportmansions.org. <laughs> so get on the website, everybody. <laughs> I'd love to meet you. But it never stops like for you. And it's taking small steps the whole time. There's this building, there's the park, there's a thousand acres of landscape, there's nine miles of road, there's six temples, one of the mm. oldest barns in southern England. There's ha-has, lakes, hills. I mean, there are many different things that we're responsible for. There's the beauty of the trees, of replanting, of the wider landscape, of the wild flower meadows, of the gardens and the orchards. So it's quite interrelated and it's a larger project, in fact, than just the castle. But the castle is a jewel in the crown at the heart of it. And I suppose I've started with each room and I start on the worst rooms. And my priority is always electrics, roof and plumbing. And then the nice bits follow on after that. But they've always got the least part of the budget, which I know I'm sure it's the same with you. And yep. it's picking and choosing where you're going to spend the money. But whenever I do anything, I think I'm doing this for the next 50 years. And that carpet's got to last that long too. So um, when the carpet man comes and says, well, it's guaranteed for 10 years, I said, rubbish, it's fine for 50, thank you very much. And it's just <laughs> looking long term, which it is. And I like things that look a little bit warm, a little bit comfortable, a little bit lived in, a little bit cosy. There's a beautiful room called Stanhope, which was the red room in Downton Abbey. The mm -hmm. silk wall covering is red and it's actually dates still from 1895 as do the curtains, which are a little bit raggedy, but you know what, they're okay. And I've hung paintings over to cover where there are some slits, but that's fine. So they're strategic. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as the whole room isn't covered with paintings, you know, it's kind of hanging on in there, but that's also fine as well. So I'm hoping that that will last another 10 years with any luck. And then that will be a major refurbishment project at some point. It's, the houses live with you, I think. They're on the journey with you. And it's not doing anything too hurried apart from catching any water before it comes either out of a pipe or in from the, in from the sky. Right, yeah. I mean, water is a real challenge and yeah. again, the electric. So it is the boring stuff. Is the, is the roof up to par for all of the buildings and, and for the castle not itself? That. Because that is our big problem. We, we spend most of our time and energy focused on the condition of our roofs. You can see the roof breakers behind me. That was a, a massive job. We, we restored it, I think, in the early 2000 era. Um, I think 39,000 tiles had to be removed. Um, and you'd think that would be, in, uh, it was just an incredible job. So are your roof and <clears throat> electrical in pretty good shape or is it just ongoing? Well, we started in 2002 after we taken over with the roof over the saloon because the lead and the extraordinary leaded windows were in a parlous state. So we spent a lot of money on that. This was well before Downton. And then about three years later, in about 2005, six, we did another huge section of roof. I'm, I'm, I tend to break things down into chunks because that's achievable. Whereas if I look at the whole thing, I think I need a large drink, but by breaking <laughs> it down into chunks, I can then do it. And it's the same with the medieval barn, which is like a cathedral. It's so beautiful. It was dates to 1438. And we're mm. work, working with oak of that, of that ilk. And the bill for over all of the barn was just astronomical in the millions, which I just don't have. But by breaking it down into two bays, you can do it. And then you can inch your way along to another bay and another bay. And actually you manage to achieve the whole thing in far less than the whole of the sum that scared you to start with. So I kind of approach things in a practical fashion. Right. And probably no nonsense. <laughs> so, right. 
but I've been doing it. I have some experience now, and experience Trudy is a, a wonderful thing because you make less mistakes, I think, as you go. <laughs> do you do you have do you have you must have a construction staff on on site, or do you hire everybody in from the outside? No, well, I've got I've got a my little my phone is full of the essential numbers being David the electrician, Jeff and Mark the plumbers. <laughs> um J josh the joiner steve the roofer i mean those mm -hmm. are the key people and dave wilson who's my tarmac um surfacing man <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also um ben the bricky and and i suppose um ashley who does trees and uh, he's got a little digger because there's usually something going wrong with a water pipe somewhere because there are miles and miles of water pipe running under the fields here so they are also another huge unseen challenge and um, when you then replace one part of the said water pipe further parts down the road aren't up to the pressure yeah. and oh, they yes we know the story burst. you know the story <laughs> okay <laughs> so yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're talking about water pipes and puddles and i'm sure people think it's a <laughs> glamorous life living in a castle which Partly it is, and we still welcome friends for, you know, for families and residents for weekends, and that is that is a joy, and that is the other side of it. But I, you know, this morning at six o'clock, actually, um, we had called a plumber because the hot water pipe had burst, and the main thing is to find it quickly, and right. the plumber cap it off by 6.30 in the morning, bloody brilliant, and then he went back to do his school run. So they're not always <laughs> working for us, but they're, they are... There's an essential team who are part of what we do here, without a doubt. And then your gardens, um, you, there are, you've got your, you've got the uh, plants growing for the gin that you're producing. Um, yeah. I, lo I love your, your columns because I think you seem to love the outdoors and the gardening side of uh, your responsibility a lot. Maybe I'm reading, misreading it, um. but um, you have a thousand acres to take care of, but not all of it is gardens, right? No, we have a thousand acres of parklands. And that's mainly the sheep, thank goodness, who are our gardeners. But there's fences. And then with around the castle, there are gardens, which is part of what I've established. And I wanted to write about in Seasons at Highclere, because it's about thinking about how we've all lived here through the ages and how we need to steward it well in order to live here for, to pass it on to future generations. So there are, I don't know how many maybe a hundred or 200 acres of gardens and lawns and gardens, but I'm not exactly sure. If I thought about it, it would be worrying again because um, <laughs> it's better sometimes not to. So we've, there's the lawn mowers, but I've created, I like creating things around memories and people. It's a lovely way to live. There's the monk's garden, which is a lovely walled garden, which um, dates back to the, the monks who lived here in 1216. So that's my earliest records are 1216, which is mm. quite cool. And you can still see the wall that's there. There's a white border, which my parents and all started and we've continued. So there's an orangery in which we grow the little oranges, which are really delicious, slightly sharp and sweet for the gin and the lemons. Mm -hmm. And then there's a- They're grown outside? No, they're grown inside, not with sadly oh, okay. with our British climate, <laughs> but they work very well. There's a secret garden. There's the wood of goodwill with specimen and native British trees. There's Geordie and I have probably planted about 200,000 flowering bulbs over the last 18 years, which is quite oh, a lot. I've just created a garden in memory of my mother-in-law, which is all blue and white. And I quite like working in there. So I took some time out on Saturday just to weed and to plant, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, listen to music. <laughs> the dogs yeah. thoroughly enjoy it. There's another garden, which I'm sort of lit to some layered terraces for memory for my the, the sixth countess, Catherine. And then I've created a rose arbor for my mother which is beautiful is now planted with roses inside and around it and the scents that's a treat for another week or so I think but and then I plant roses climbing up trees and do tree carvings it's fun you can have bright ideas and I think because it's Geordie and I then you could just decide to do it and that's a treat Trudy actually so now and you 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 also have fields of uh, plant material 
I, I think uh, Patsy told me before the show started that you do provide um, things to the queen herself. Is it oats or wheat? Oh, or no, no, well, we, we grow oats for the horse world business. So oh, okay. for all the trainers. So yes, I hope all the horses, especially the queens obviously run very fast, but um, so we have a special oat processing business. So it's again, trying to feed horses naturally, the best unprocessed foods, the best combination to help the digestion. If we all look after our tummies, maybe it'll help look after our health. So it's all about our tummies, <laughs> both for animals and for people. But, right. um, yes, no, you're right. And then we've got wild flower meadows and flower banks and um, space for animals, space for us to walk and space for us not to walk, space for wildlife, because otherwise we trample and disturb everything. So. It's trying to let, to leave space for those who with whom we share this beautiful world. So it's a very comprehensive property that you have um, ownership of and you, you must take care of. So of course, I have to ask a question or two about movie making. Yes. And what it is like to have a movie crew in your home. We, we have, with the Gilded Age, we have certainly had a good sense of what it's like to have the film crew around, but we're, we don't live in those houses. You live in Highclere. Uh, I guess I want to go back and understand how did this opportunity of having Downton Abbey filmed at Highclere Castle come about? I know you know Julian Fellows. Did he have a role in deciding where the filming would take place? And um, what was your reaction? Because as you know, and for those who are listening, uh, many museums, and yours is a museum as well, are very reluctant to allow film crews into our properties because things can happen. Um, and many museums don't allow it at all. So we went back and forth and decided, you know, if Lady Carnarvon can do it, we can do it too. So how did, you, <laughs> yes, how so. did you make the decision to put it all out there and trust the film industry so that not a lot of damage would occur. I think you have to go in there in a practical fashion. Um, firstly, I thought I like Julian Emma, Julie and Emma Fellows hugely, and they are a double act, those two, as my husband and myself are. Emma's an amazing lady, very smart, very well read, and a very good balance to Julian. And We'd done some other small parts, small filming already. So you have some experience, which is hugely helpful. And then when you're setting out a contract, as you did, it's thinking about how you can safeguard what steps you should do. So we've got lists of do's and don'ts and you define and draw the lines, which rooms they're going to use and therefore the rest they're not. You can always go over that line, but it's always best to define the line. So it's in your gift. Not, not theirs to assume, because that just makes it all work a little bit better. And many of the gardens in which they film are not within our contract, but it's a joy to welcome them into it and it works very well. So it's a realization of the, of the partnership and collaboration which you have. And I think it's, you know, we have shifts of guides present in the room the whole time to look after the hot lights, to make sure things are unplugged, to understand what they're trying to achieve. So Highclere looks beautiful in Dance Navi, and that we're trying to achieve, which is the house is still standing with everything intact at the end of the day. So um, it's just that balance, which is something which you obviously set out as I'm sure you did. And then you, and then you balance with the realities of making it work in everyday life. And experience again is such a huge help. And for also for the film crew, we have we work with their location manager, which for throughout Downton Abbey was a wonderful man called Sparky or Mark Ellis, as he's really called. And then we established the communication from their side to Sparky, from Sparky to our castle manager, John Guntill, with myself running alongside it. And the man of last recourse resort is um, my husband. <laughs> So, so so you've gone then got that structure which helps it's clarity of communication which is so helpful and and I think that it, it's those elements which are business elements and business decisions which can then help 
you manage relationships when you're both trying to appear to your best, I think. So did you have any idea um, that D Downton Abbey would take off and be as successful as it has turned out to be? Oh my goodness, none of us did. I think we'd all have otherwise taken the opportunity to rewrite the contracts from the start. <laughs> but I think it surprised all of us. And, you know, we wonder whether anybody would watch it, Trudy. And then we didn't expect it to be such an extraordinary hit in America. It was very successful on PBS. It was the mm -hmm. right market for the programme. If it had perhaps been on another platform, it might not have achieved the same success. So there's many different points of, of luck. Um, Rebecca Reaton at Masterpiece was a very instrumental part of the good luck or the hard work. And those, those then began to set it out in its journey. It was the right platform here, ITV, a very brave decision of Peter Fincham, who was CEO at the time, to go into a costume drama. And again, a Rebecca Reaton. So, and then it was Gareth Neem and Julian Fellows on the carnival side. So again, it's a leap of faith, a leap in the dark, but isn't it important to make those leaps? we should all continue to do so. And as long as you put in some care and structure around it, things do go wrong sometimes, and then you have to sort it out, and then you have to move on again. Now, we have found that Lord Fellows is very secretive. I have asked him a thousand times to give me a hint about season two. I have tried to trick him. And that man does not falter. He will not <laughs> share anything. Did you have the same experience? <laughs> yes, no, he didn't share anything. And I completely understood that. So I simply accepted it. And that's <laughs> not my role was to sort of in, interrogate at all. You know, we all knew once they started filming where they were going, because you said we was, you know, involved in where they were filming, what they needed from the script, where Computer Village was, where the green room was, etc. But we knew that if it's going to be success on TV, you need that, that sense of a journey, surprise and secret. You need things to unfold in front of the viewer and not to have inadvertently spoilt the storyline in advance. So in right. that way, I was never particularly worried about it and respect, try to respect the boundaries between what I was delivering, which was simply a, um, a good location, central character, which I think Dan Heitley became for Downton Abbey. And he was creating, um, curating a wonderful script and the time in which this um, Downton Abbey was set is a time and a language in which I think he excels at his writing. So it all came together in that way. And, and then equally well thinking, how can we um, make this play, this house even more enjoyable for those who fall in love with it? What are the elements to highlight? How can we make people feel they're in a bit of a set? What sort of the storylines can we bring out once it's on television and go from there? So it's, it was not a completely stepping away from, but it was understanding how we could then best highlight um, Downton and Highclere later on. Have you seen um, the latest movie? Yes, of course I did, okay. yes. We were lucky enough to go to the premiere here in England and okay. London, and which was um, great fun. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think we all needed a new era. And the whole yes. cinema was laughing out loud, which was great. So it was good fun. Obviously, there's tears as well, but that is so in life. And I think our world, our real world at the moment, is rather frightening and very challenging. And I think Downton Abbey, a new era, is a bit of a world apart. It takes us into a slightly different time and place but with some of the same challenges for the people who were there, which we can recognize, but we all need to escape a little bit. We can't continue to live in the, in the fear that otherwise we're surrounding with. We can come back to that, to look at it. We also need to remove ourselves from it. So I think it was much needed and it's a family film. That's what's so great about it. Right. And everybody loves it, whether you're, you know, 10 years old, some 10 year old girls in particular seem to enjoy it or granny who's 90. So it's fabulous. Right, right. And well, I have to ask, have you seen any of the episodes of Gilded Age? I certainly have seen. Oh, I haven't right. seen all of them, but I've thoroughly enjoyed them. 
But funnily enough, again, it'd be very interesting for me when I'm coming because I wanted to think, was this here? Was that there? I wanted to know where some of the scenes were set. And that was quite interesting again. So that will definitely draw me into your wonderful houses, as I'm sure it will many other visitors. Well, we, he, uh, they used uh, a number of different houses. And of course, in our case, um, a room at the Hunter House might be a lawyer's office in New York. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, or actually it wasn't in New York, it was in Pennsylvania. So when you're watching the show, you've got to really be alert to, wait a minute, that's our, that's our room. And yes. then it all comes together. Actually, we're creating a tour for the public um, that will take people from all the rooms that were featured in the Gilded Age and then talk about those rooms in the context of the, of the era of the Gilded Age. Yes. And that will probably debut in the middle of July. And I think it will be a great success. I'm sure it will be. Absolutely. The numbers of people who ask, they want to know everything about every part of the TV show. And, and it's only had one, ep one season, so who knows what's going to happen in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely, Trudy. But I always think, you know, I never put my eggs in one basket and it's always just, you know, some people have not seen Downton Abbey, can you believe it, who come here? So it's just <laughs> making sure there's a little bit of history, a little bit of movie set, <clears throat> a little bit of interest about what how life is today or the past. So it's just, I don't mind what makes people happy. There's different elements all the way through. The, the thing that um, has struck me, and I and this is really a tribute to Julian Fellows, um, I wouldn't, I'm not surprised that he knows British history well, because he's English. Um, well, actually, he wasn't born in England. He was born in Egypt, wasn't he? He was, yes. Yes. Um, but he, he really has captured American history very well so far. And we do know, because he's had meetings with us, that he knows American history very well. In fact, he sometimes corrects us. He has walked, <laughs> walked through our houses and said, mm, I think there's a mistake on your plaque. The date for that painting is not. And you know, <laughs> there's nothing worse than being corrected by Julian Fellows. And each time he corrects us, I always go to our curator and say, he can't possibly be right, can he? And of course he is. I think that um, I, I've really come to appreciate the historian side of his profession, that he, he isn't just writing a story. He's writing a story that is based on American experiences in the 1880s and the 1890s. And I, I have to believe that that is true of British history in the 1920s for you. Well, I think the success of something like the Gilded Age is because Julian based it in the history of the time. It gives it a reality and a grounding again. And then I think that's what we as the audience immediately then fall into. And it is a fascinating time, which led to such extraordinary wealth in America. And right. so much of the resources and technology which form the basis of our life today. So, you know, I can see exactly why he was drawn to it. Funny enough, I'm an enormous fan of Edith Wharton, and I think her books are completely extraordinary, and I'm quite sure he would have read all of them as well. I also like things like Absalom, Absalom, and then the later, you know, Great Gatsby and things like that, but it's a, it's a fascinating time in terms of American literature as well as of history. Um, and I've just been writing about Theodore Roosevelt and bringing him into my latest book, which was about Egypt and the Fifth Earl of Carnarvon and J.P. Morgan's another character who comes into it. So you begin to get these cross links again then. But he is very well read and he, you know, likes grounding his books because I think that his stories and scripts, because that's the success. I mean, in terms of, of Downton Abbey, there's things that, um, you know, he's using to spur off the story, whether it's a refrigerator or a or a hairdryer or something <laughs> yeah. extraordinary or electric lights. <laughs> um, and obviously in the First World War, this was a proper hospital and in Downton Abbey convalescent home, which he knew all about. And he never necessarily knew he'd be writing the second series. I mean, his success has come 
he was hugely successful before winning, you know, achieving the Oscar for Gosford Park, but he has never stopped. I don't know how he does all that he does do as he goes forward and holds the different characters and lives in his head as they walk forward. This is extraordinary. So chapeau to Julian Fellows. <laughs> I agree. Um, I wanted to get back to sort of real life Downton Abbey, if you don't mind, or Highclere. There have been a lot of quite famous people who have walked through the doors. And I'm not talking about the actors and actresses in Downton Abbey. I'm talking throughout the history of Highclere. So maybe you want to, uh, you mentioned um, Edith Wharton, which sparked in my mind, Henry James. So that's why this question is coming from. Um, can you touch on some of the people who have uh, been guests in your house? There have been extraordinary guests in this home for all that time, even going back to the 13th or 14th century, you know, when royalty came to stay or Queen Caroline married to George II came to stay in the 18th century. My visitor books, however, really start when this house was transformed by Sir Charles Barry into the Italianate palace you see today. So that's more like 1842. So it did welcome um, Lord Salisbury, Disraeli, politicians and statesmen, um, Prince of Wales, Edward VII, Voisin, um, Henry James. Um, I've got little notes from Theodore Roosevelt because he knew somebody else who was here. General Patton came for lunch here just before mm. D-Day. Winston Churchill. Um, I can't tell you, there's a ridiculous number of names to drop. <laughs> All such interesting people. Obviously, many people from the world of Egyptology and archaeology, such as Herbert Winlock um, from the Metropolitan Museum of New York and Joe Lyndon Smith at that particular time, some big American um, philanthropists as well as the actual archaeologists, um, great men who were to do with motor cars, because the fifth I'll have so many motor cars. I was thrilled to find Robert Browning. I'm a fan of Robert Browning or um, various um, uh, people like Henry James. And he scribbled this note saying how much he'd enjoyed his stay here. And he stayed here a couple of times. I'm often mm. looking for no names and not finding them. I was thrilled to find that Charles Adams had stayed here for Christmas in 1866, whose father and grandfather were presidents of the United States of America. And he had been appointed by um, Abraham Lincoln as his diplomat to the court of St. James to London. Obviously, Lincoln had sadly been assassinated, but Charles Adams was still here, very, very bright man. And he'd come to stay for Christmas with his wife and his daughter. And Lord Carnarvon was discussing the Canadian constitution with him and asking him how he thought he could improve on the American constitution. Okay. So it was just such amazing little notes you get in diaries and the fourth L kept so many diaries. And then it's the little notes saying that I obviously liked Charles Adams, but he found his wife talked a bit too much, but he rather liked his daughter. So you think, <laughs> oh my God, I'm talking too much. But um, so it's some little notes like that. And then later on, obviously you get to um, um, pianists and composers in the 90s, there's such as Malcolm Sargent, who was very famous in this country, and very much part of the BBC proms and the orchestral world. Mm -hmm. The Duke of um, Kent, who was godfather to my father-in-law, who sadly died in 1942 when he was flying to America during World War II. And then through to the present day, when obviously we have also been honoured by the um, by members of the royal family staying here as well. Mm. So it's um, a busy what visitor's book. Legacy, a tremendous, tremendous story. And I hope that people who are listening or watching this um, will know why it is valuable and important to come and see Lady Carnarvon. Oh, I 20th, very much hope twenty third room June. will be full. Yes, June and, the twenty third. Wonderful. Right, and I think uh, you will not be disappointed. And we get to try your high clear gin on top of it. So, if you are interested, um, go to our website newportmansions.org and look for Lady Carnarvon's name, and you can get your tickets there. And thank you very, very much, Lady Carnarvon. This is we're so looking forward to seeing you soon. And I know you're going to be a big hit. And I thank you for your time this morning. I know you have a busy day, so we appreciate your time.
Thank, Thank you, you, Trudy. I am very much looking forward to be with you. So I'm going to see you on June the 23rd, and I hope lots more people look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.